Black. <laughs> Very good. So people are just coming in now. I can see it on screen three here. It's excellent. So thank you very much for joining us uh, here uh, this evening. So numbers coming in. There we go. Just to hit over 100. So we're getting 102, 105, etc. So that, that's very good. Just opening up here at the moment. The stained glass. Display and spectacle, Pugin and uh, Tiffany. Those of you who've already joined us here already, 107 of you, uh, there is the chat function uh, at the bottom. Do let us know where you're dialing in from. So it's all, always great to, 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 know, to know that. Uh, and similarly, who you are, what you do, just something there in the chat to say hello to us. Great, if I might have the next slide then please, we're ready to go. So my name is David Stringer uh, Lamar. I'm uh, pleased to be the senior assistant at the uh, Wishful Company of Glaziers and Painters of Glass. And welcome to everybody for this fifth um, webinar uh, from, from the Glaziers. Um, it's my delight to, to moderate the expert panelists uh, that we have from assembled from the UK and the USA. So another one of our uh, excellent international uh, engagements. I can see you're telling us where you're coming in from here as well. If you see my eyes going down, because I've got three screens here uh, to make sure everything's going on. So please don't uh, treat it as, as disrespectful. I am here in the city of London. In fact, I'm just in London Wall. Um, for those of you, it's, it's no longer sun shining. It's actually gray and a bit cold here, but that, that's the backdrop we've got. So you don't see all the bits here uh, in, in the building. Um, let me open the first poll and then I'll start to talk to you. So if I open this, this first poll, you'll see coming up on the screen now, hopefully launch the poll. There it is, you can see it. So number one, just to give us an idea, are you a member of the Worshipful Company of Glaziers and uh, Painters of Glass? And then the second one, what is your interest in glass? Are you a practitioner, artist, conservator, et cetera, uh, or just passing by and interested? We didn't put not interested in there because I assume you wouldn't be here if that, if that was actually the case. So, so coming in nicely here, just to answer those, those questions would be terrific. So you'll see down there at, at the bottom in the chat, do have a conversation uh, with each other. You know, as I say, let us know where you're, you're, you're coming in from. And similarly, as we go through the session, there's questions and answers uh, down there. And do put in your, your questions, of course, and there's also the facility to vote uh, for the ones that you particularly like. And of course, that will help me at the, towards the end of this session to, to pick them out, kind of the cab rank principle as the more popular questions uh, will come to the top and hopefully we'll do our best uh, to, get, to get through through them all. I'm going to end the polling in five seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. I'm ending the polling and I'm going to share the results with you now so we can see uh, what we have. So you'll see it in front of you. So yes, a member of the Glaciers, 32%. Members of another livery company, 34%. So welcome indeed. And uh, not yet. So, oh, we've got some interest there from 6% in joining. How exciting is that? And interested, 8%. Oh, and practitioners, 20%. So that's very useful um, to know. Um, and also very useful to our expert panel members as well in terms of how to pitch everything. Oh, we've got somebody just saying here, coming in from Florida, I can see. Uh, Scotland, uh, Master Company of Nurses uh, from Surrey. Thank you very much uh, for joining. All adds to the frivolity uh, that we have here uh, in the glaciers. It's now my great pleasure uh, to invite uh, the Master Glazier to address us. Master. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. To begin and in the best city of London tradition, I bid a welcome to my fellow livery masters, prime wardens, upper bailiffs and clerks. 
The Aldermanic Sheriff, Michael Manelli, apologises for not joining us this evening, but he would like you all to know that he has a genuine interest in stained glass. Having visited, he says, the Stained Glass Museum at Ely twice, but incognito, and as a boy in Florida, he actually visited the Morse Museum. For those who know little about the Glaziers Company, we are one of London's medieval craft guilds or livery companies, and the Glaziers history dates back to 1328. Now, there are some masters, prime wardens and the upper bailiff who belong to livery companies that are even older than that. These days, the Glaziers continue fully to promote arch architectural glass art and to play an active role in the civic life of the City of London. We have, I think, a real treat for all of you tonight. Three renowned experts will, in a relatively short space of time, provide some insights into the creativity of Augustus Pugin and Louis Comfort Tiffany, concentrating on how these giants both used world trade and cultural exhibitions and expositions to showcase their work. Pugin exhibited in the Great Exhibition in London in 1851, and then Tiffany exhibited at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago a little bit later in 1893. Our experts may also go on to comment on which of these giants made the greatest contribution to culture and the arts, if such a comparison is possible, we'll see. So, our distinguished experts are Dr. Jasmine Allen, curator of the Stained Glass Museum in Ely, Cambridgeshire. Jennifer Talheimer, curator and collection manager at the Charles Hosmer Morse Museum in Florida. And finally, Rolf Achilles of the Driehaus Museum in Chicago, and a trustee of the Dreamhouse Foundation. Again, to everyone who's joined us, you are all very welcome, and I hope you enjoy this webinar. Finally, a number of you have joined us from overseas and especially from the United States of America. With that in mind, I'd like to ask our artist Freeman, Kathy Jordan, who is also president of the American Glass Guild, to say a brief word, Kathy. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, thank you for inviting me. And it's, it's a pleasure to uh, be involved once again in the series. In the United States, we've enjoyed the collaboration of the US and the UK. Um, we've had an, an extraordinary year, just like all of the other artists with the pandemic. Uh, we have not been able to meet in person here in the United States for conferences. Um, we've had two, uh, two conferences that we've had to um, cancel, but we will be having a virtual conference um, this June. And on our website, we can learn more about our speakers um, and the activities and auction uh, that the American Glass Guild will be offering. Um, I'm really excited to hear the speakers. Um, it's the afternoon for us here in the United States. So um, please, please uh, begin. There's a lot to hear. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Kathy. Always good to, to have you involved and, and strengthen the bridge that exists between our, our, two, uh, two, our two countries. Right. So the format, we're going to have the view from our, our three experts, and then we're going to get into the questions and answers. So do put your questions in there. Great to see lots of people commenting in the chat and letting us know uh, where you're dialing in from. So Jasmine Allen, let's start off with you, if we may. Um, we can have the next slide, please. So what was the 1851 Great Exhibition and what was so special about what Pugin did there? Jasmine. Thanks, David. Well, the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations, if we use its full title of 1851, was an enormous and very exciting event, which took place in a large glass building known as the Crystal Palace. I'm sure you've all heard of that um, and can conjure up images of this glass building, which was designed by Joseph Paxton. And exhibits from across the world were sent and displayed in this exhibition, which was visited by over 6 million visitors. 
And contributions from the UK were divided into these categorized sections. Uh, there were certain sections for raw materials, for manufacturers, for machinery, and exhibits from other countries were kind of kept in separated foreign courts. Um, what Pugin did was exhibit in a medieval court. And if we can have the next slide, um, you can see on the left here, this medieval court, which was the idea of Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin, an architect, designer, polemicist, and an ardent advocator of the Gothic style. And by the time of the Great Exhibition of 1851, he was a really well-known figure, um, but it was this medieval court really that brought him the most attention and when he became a household name. And arguably it was really the culmination of his lifetime's work. So the court, as not, of the, not as the name suggests, it wasn't actually filled with medieval objects, uh, genuine medieval objects. It was actually a collection of very contemporary modern objects designed in the medieval Gothic revival style amongst them were stained glass. So this was a very colourful display, as you can see in this image. And I'll say a bit more about the um, objects in a moment. Um, but really, Pugin's idea of this display actually came as soon as he heard about the Great Exhibition. He heard from his friend Herbert Minton, and he became very excited, sketching ideas on the spot, um, thinking this was a fantastic way to share his ideas about the applicability of the Gothic medieval style of design to the world. And he wanted to bring together from the start his key collaborators, John Gregory Crace, a decorator, John Hardman, metalwork and stained glass, Herbert Minton, ceramics, and George Myers, who contributed stone carving. But when the details were announced for exhibitors and this idea of the exhibition categorization, categorization was brought in, uh, that didn't fit at all with those uh, categories. But amazingly, Pugin was kind of given special um, permission by Henry Cole, who was in charge of the organization of the exhibition to allow these people to um, exhibit as a group. And they really had a prime position with this medieval court. So the, the difference really uh, from the other displays was the fact that these objects were linked to an idea, not a material classification. And if, um, you can just go to the next slide. You will see, um, you get a sense of some of these exhibits. So much of it was ecclesiastical. We had altar plate, vestments, fittings, uh, a large display of stained glass, which we'll talk about in a moment, and uh, a chancel screen. So quite a lot of uh, ecclesiastical um, exhibits, but also secular items. There were Gothic chandeliers, staircases, uh, wedding jewelry, textiles, uh, jardiniers, which are basically fancy garden pots designed in the Gothic styles. Two great tiled stoves for your kitchen. And actually you can see that in the centre here with a kind of iron grill around it um, and two Gothic pianos and of course stained glass. And it's stained glass actually that you can see in this slide at the back. I appreciate it's a black and white engraving, but you can probably just make out those Gothic cusps of the windows um, at the back of the court there, which was stained glass contributed by Hardman. Terrific, uh, th thank you very much on that. Um, in terms of this Gothic style, did it, did the, you know, Pugin after this, but did it really give it an, an even, you know, bigger push so people would be even more interested in Gothic style or on no particular difference, do you think? Absolutely. This, this court had an enormous lasting impact on the development of stained glass as well as the development of the Gothic revival across the world. So this slide here um, shows you actually um, some of the Hardman glass that was exhibited at the court. Um, the, the two images on the left are both from Pugin's own church at uh, Ramsgate, the church that he built with his own funds next to his house. It's fantastic to visit if you're in the area. Um, designed by Pugin, made by Hardman. Um, and you can see really, it would take someone who really knows what they're looking at to know uh, what, what, who made this glass and uh, what to date it, because actually his ability to design the medieval style was based on really, really uh, good study of medieval glass. He was very interested in studying medieval architecture. He published um, an extraordinary amount on this and his designs were 
kind of a continuation of the medieval art form, um, but for a 19th century audience. You can see that here with the grisaille, the, the white glass background, the painted uh, foliage on, and these figure scenes, which are in these um, kind of cusped medallions, um, beautiful red and blue colors, which are very typical, um, of course, of 13th century medieval glass as well. And Hardman, I said, um, who, who made these, um, he was key in, the, in starting up the Hardman stained glass firm. So Pugin had a really direct influence on the development of 19th century stained glass and that particular firm especially. Terrific, and did, did Pugin work a lot with Hardman or were they just occasional partners? Well, interestingly, um, Pugin's involvement with stained glass actually goes back way before his involvement with, with Hardman. He started designing stained glass in 1838 and initially used a number of other glass painters, uh, names like Warrington, Willamont and Wales, the three W's as I call them. Um, and they were all very established glass painters in the early Gothic revival in the, in the early um, mid Victorian period. And Pugin was constantly dissatisfied with them, fell out with some of the artists, he argued over the price, the execution, the quality of the glass. I mean, he was a real character, a bit of a control freak, and he wanted more control. So by 1845, after kind of putting up with this for a few years and moving from one glass painter to another, he turned to his friend John Hardman, who had a successful uh, metalworking firm in Birmingham, and said in 1845, I have a scheme for a stained glass shop and basically persuaded them to set up a stained glass workshop in their premises in Birmingham. And they, they worked very closely together for uh, the rest of Pugin's life and then beyond Pugin's life, Hardman continued to make stained glass and you know, their glass is to be found all over the world. Um, so it, they really went on to become the, one of the biggest firms um, that we've ever seen. And uh, their glass, although they were both Catholics can be seen in both Anglican and Catholic contexts. And um, Pugin's work, when because he, he died in 1852, not long after the Great Exhibition, was actually continued by um, his son-in-law, John Hardman Powell, who was the uh, nephew of John Hardman. So they were also related by marriage, uh, very good friends, lifelong friends with John Hardman and Pugin. Excellent. Uh, thank you very, very much indeed. And I obviously I picked up on that bit that probably still exists, isn't it? The, the how should we put it? The energetic conversations that exist between clients and producers of stained glass. I'll say no more uh, on that, perhaps not changed through, throughout the ages. Excellent, thank you very much uh, indeed. Right, expert number two. May I have the next slide, please? I'd now like to call upon you, Jennifer, uh, to enlighten us further, to build upon the excellent start by Jasmine. So what was the world's Columbian exposition in Chicago in 1893? And what did Tiffany do there? Jennifer. Well, the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition was held in Chicago and was really the introduction of Louis Comfort Tiffany's industrial art to the world. There are many, many displays there, just like 1851. It was really the world coming together and showing off their products. Now, Louis Comfort Tiffany's father, Charles Tiffany, of course, had started Tiffany and Company, which we all love to get little blue boxes from. But um, so he was established and really got the central space at the Columbian Exposition. And so Louis was fortunate enough to get half of that space in a prime location. So it was a really wonderful coming out for him and his artwork. And he'd exhibited as a painter throughout the years, um, but not on this scale. And he also, at the same time was actually displaying his paintings as well. But 1893 was a celebration of um, the American, it was very American and we were celebrating Columbus coming to America. But more importantly, it was Americans who were proud of the rebirth of a city of, of Chicago, which had burned down just 20 years earlier, flattened by fire and had really reinvented itself. There was a rebirth in the city that created, offered a blank slate to architects and designers and artists to really redefine um, what a city was and make it very American. So Tiffany's display was really a part of that. 
and he was claiming the new modern art. Um, and so you can see here on the left is an overview of the World's Columbian Exposition and on the right is Tiffany's booth there. And you can see some of the stained glass windows were actually using natural light from this great manufacturer's liberal arts building. Um, at the time, one of the largest buildings constructed. And it was composed of three different rooms. One was the chapel and then one was a light room and a dark room. Most of the exhibition focused on ecclesiastical work. Now you can go to the next slide. Tiffany started out as a painter and was frustrated with the limitations of canvas and paper. So literally wanted to use light as a means of communication. And so that really led naturally to his um, entering the world of leaded glass. And on the left, you can see the Madonna and Child window. And um, so he wasn't, Tiffany very rarely worked in the Gothic tradition. There, were, there are a number of works, but that really wasn't his focus, Romanesque. And um, eventually he came from the tradition. He was really coming from the aspect of the aesthetic movement, which was really creating objects of beauty, not based upon uh, past tradition, um, but he would borrow bits and pieces from different aspects um, to integrate into one world. And he was a painter, then he became an interior decorator, and, but ecclesiastical work was really the bread and butter. So 1893 was at a time when um, America was really becoming industrialized um, and has established the railroads. And it was a great time for exchanging materials and products which were available to be available all over the country. And Tiffany's display at the fair was really a show place for that. And um, churches were being built and ecclesiastical art to fill them was really in great demand. So that was the focus of the exhibition was really the ecclesiastical work. And he had just started an official department dedicated to that a few years before this exhibition. So it was really a marketing, his display there was marketing and placement into a niche market. Um, he began work in flat glass in the 1870s and um, was really more interested in pushing the technology of glass. And so early on, he starts out really trying to one up existing known paintings. And of course, the window on the left is based upon a Botticelli window. And so Tiffany not only could reproduce that painting, but could do it better where the light was coming through it and it became dimensional and um, innovative. And so many of the windows basically offered different styles so that anybody that came through the exhibit could look and say, oh, I want to do this type of, uh, this is the theme of my church. So this is how I want to do it. So it was a little bit for everybody. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. So here you can see that on the left is a window that was made for the domestic market. And it, we know a lot about this window um, that it took, that the setting for it was actually taken from his 72nd Street studio house, his own studio. And um, it's an incredibly complicated window. So in 1893, he's uh, started to integrate things like plating glass and, um, uh, acid etching glass. And so it's this, this kind of rethinking of traditional glass. But the most important thing that he was working on and um, perhaps stole from uh, John Lafarge, there's a little bit of, you know, we're back and forth with that, but um, was opalescent glass. So adding the color directly into the glass so that you could get this mixture of tones in one piece of glass. And so Tiffany really ran with that. And at the time it was associated, this type of opalescent glass was really associated with America and um, newspaper and magazine accounts would actually call it American glass. So um, the reputation really became associated with that. 
And on the right, you can see studies for the entombment. And on the right of that is the head of Joseph of Arimathea, which is um, one of the focus points of uh, his entombment window. And this piece actually has about four or five layers of glass plated. So it's almost like a hologram, holograph looking in depth into the face in different stages. So it's really a remarkable piece. And um, it's this kind of artwork that really defined who Tiffany was and the World's Columbian Exposition was really introducing him to that world. Terrific. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed for that uh, tour of Tiffany, as it were. Lots of questions come to my mind from it. And I, because it sounds like he was experimenting. So he starts off as a canvas painter, if I'm going to put it that way. And then you say moves into to, uh, uh, the medium of glass and then ends up with opalescent glass, etc. Was he always experimenting through or did he settle on a, a particular way of using glass? What, what's your, your comment about that? He was always building upon what he would learn. And he was smart enough to know that he could experiment and he could go only so far. And then he could bring in people who knew much more about the material. And so anytime, anything he got involved in, and there's nothing that you can really think of that Tiffany wasn't involved in. He um, started out with painting, then leaded glass, did mosaics. Um, enamel work, jewelry, photography, uh, movies. I mean, there's every type of material he really had his hand in. Um, typically people associate him with lamps or windows, but it was a vast production. And he was really the central person in it. So if you think about companies like Apple, where Steve Jobs is really the person that's driving it, and then he has many workers who are brilliant and really know their stuff who are designing and promoting and everything else. That's really the role that Tiffany played in it. He would kind of start with a, with a thought and an idea and a direction and take it as far as he could and then leave it to these wonderful workers that assisted him. Brilliant, thank you very much. I like that idea that's gonna stick in my mind, Steve Jobs uh, and, and Tiffany as a, as a comparison there. And so you were talking about uh, the Colombian exhibition and lots of different products are on show, different styles, but is there or is there not a Tiffany style as it were, or is he just does everything? He does do everything, but there is an aesthetic that is associated with Tiffany and workers who, uh, designers who worked with him, the people who work with him, all knew that we're working in the Tiffany style and Tiffany had photo files, which we have in our collection, thousands of images from around the world. And so he really, that's how he honed in this style is by providing this photo archive of, this is what you use as reference and fed into that. And so, you know, you can kind of there, even though there's a diversity of product and um, different looks to things, they really were centrally focused. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, most in enlightening. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Now, uh, next slide, please. And on to expert number three. So, Rolf, uh, we're on to you. Uh, next slide. And the question, can you give us some more context about Tiffany? And indeed, who were his great rivals, not only in the US, but also in Europe? Rolf. Thank you. We've had, had a good start. I hope you can all hear me easily. And thank you, Jennifer, for bringing in uh, Chicago and Jasmine also for the uh, 1851 fair, the 1893 fair, as we just heard, was extremely important for Chicago because Chicago had had the good fortune in 1871 of burning down. And that allowed, I say good fortune, because that allowed the city to be rebuilt. And it did not, in the first decade, it rebuilt in the way that it had looked before the fire. And then it was rebuilt a second time beginning about 1880 in a new look and the downtown of Chicago gets its skyscrapers. Louis Sullivan and others designed Boynton designed tall buildings. The world had never seen tall buildings quite like these and the buildings had lobbies. And along with all this architecture that was being built that was commercial, there was also the interest 
and culture and placed in between the commercial high rises were cultural institutions like museums and theaters and the like. And the ultimate statement for culture becomes the auditorium building in Chicago. And that's envisioned in 1886 and planned in 1887 and then built in 1888-89. It's an enormous building and the windows, the glass that you see on display on the screen are windows from the auditorium building and that's all I will be showing you from the auditorium building. The firm that designed these was Louis Sullivan. The firm that manufactured these windows and there are hundreds of them are Healy and Malay. Healy and Malay are not household names. It's an organ, it's a group, a partnership that was founded in 1879 in Chicago. And they won the commission to do the auditorium building windows. This was against European entries and others. It's Healy and Malay. And you'll notice that the windows have no paint on them. All of the color is in the glass. It's all done with oxides and the like. And that is a characteristic of American glass. And in 1889, the auditorium building was finished and then exhibited. We have to keep in mind that Chicago was had 350 inhabitants in 1830. 350, they counted dogs, cats, parakeets, whatever. By 1900, it was 1.5 million people. It's the fastest growing city that we know of in the world. That's still a city. And as their cultural landmark in 1889, the auditorium building stands in Chicago. Well, in the same year, the uh, Exposition Universelle in Paris of 1889 had entries from Chicago. There was a Chicago pavilion. And in that pavilion was glass by Healy and Malay. The whole pavilion was more or less de dedicated to the auditorium building. And the winning second prize purchase prize winners were the Healy and Malay Chicago Auditorium Building. So they were not only displayed in 1889 in Paris, but then go into the Musée d'Art Décoratif immediately and are there until 1982, and then go into the Musée d'Orsay where you can still see the Chicago entries. I mention all this because it's not painted glass, it's anti-Tiffany in a way. And this is the kind of glass that um, the immigrants liked. It's relatively easy to make because you do just put color pieces together. You don't have to have a painterly skill, for example, like Tiffany or um, Hardman or others in the traditional painters. The competition for the American window style of just colored glass was the European glass specifically in the Midwest was Franz Meyer Company of Munich, FX Zettler of Munich, and Tiroler Glasanstalt of Innsbruck, TGA. All three of these are Catholic. The Catholics made up the largest denomination in the Midwest. About 75% of the immigrants were Catholic and their churches were not about to have a Tiffany window in them or a East Coast window made by some Protestant upstart as far as the Catholics were concerned. And instead of just doing one window the way the traditional uh, European and East Coast Americans designed windows, the, the immigrants, whether they were Catholic Irish, Catholic German, Catholic Polish, Catholic Italians, turned to Franz Meyer who could deliver 18 windows in a set of the life of Jesus, the life of Mary, the life of St. Patrick, all painted and a third of the price installed of a Tiffany window or a lamb window, which was another sizable studio in the US at the time. Getting into this bandwagon is Emil Fry in St. Louis. He begins in 1898, he had studied in Munich and he paints on the glass. He does not do the 
Chicago style or the American style of glass as we see them and that uh, the French saw in 1889 and the Europeans then saw. You think of Victor Horta's early glass, it's all like the auditorium Helian Malay windows, sorry. The English company that has a presence in the US uh, is Healy, is uh, Heaton, Butler, and Baines, and they're in Episcopal churches and Presbyterian churches. They, in effect, compete with Tiffany for windows. Whereas Franz Meyer did not compete with Tiffany because he's almost exclusively in Catholic churches. Tiffany did have some presence in Chicago with the, audit, with the public library building that has two domes on it. One is a great Tiffany dome, a Tiffany glass that was all from Kokomo, Indiana. And that was finished in 1897. And Healy and Malay did the second dome, which was finished in 1897, also with glass from Kokomo, Indiana. It was the opalescent glass company of Kokomo that delivered uh, the glass. And they made all of the glass. If I could have the next picture. The ceiling in the auditorium building, it's a glass ceiling. It has very innovative American glass, Healy and Malay, Louis Sullivan designed. As you can see, there's cast glass in the center of the right picture that projects, it's inserted. The red and the clear glass striations around are characteristic to Healy and Malay like to use these. Healy and Malay never signed any windows. There's no archives. We know nothing, we know very little about the firm. There's are no archival evidence has survived. But their windows are in numerous places, and we're slowly creating a catalog. As you can see here, the wall, the um, sash windows left on the right side that can be opened. They're enormous on the, the ceiling. Some ceiling lights could be moved back and forth. Next slide, please. And there's a great stairwell. The auditorium building is still there. It's now partly Roosevelt College and the auditorium. The great stairwell has enormous sash windows. One of these windows weighs 100 pounds. And you can move them up and down for air in the circulating throughout the building. There's an enormous Japanism influence in the Helian Malay glass. These um, flower rosettes are taken directly from some Japanese model books and copy books that uh, Healy and Malay had brought from Paris. But it's this window composition and style that in 1887 sort of sweeps through the Midwest where the immigrants want nice windows, especially the immigrants that are not Catholic or not Lutheran, but fundamentalists, Seventh-day Adventists, and others, um, Pentecostals, the great Pentecostal revivals and uh, origins are in the 1830s in the United States. And they do not want figurative windows, they want just colored windows. And so the market was in Chicago, it was in St. Louis, it was in Kansas City, and even on the West Coast, there were some great manufacturers of windows, all of them competing with Tiffany, directly and indirectly. Thank you. Terrific. Terrific. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I think you know that really gives us a great flavor because we're talking about here Tiffany, Pugin, etc., the main bout as it were, but then you kindly catalog all these other uh, people as well. And interesting about the immigrant uh, religion, cost in their different styles um, as well. So amongst that list that you, you kindly provided, Rolf, who would be the major uh, competitors uh, to, 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 to Tiffany at this particular stage? If, among the Catholics, it's Franz Meyer and F.X. Zettler. In Chicago, there are over a thousand ecclesiastic Meyer windows that were installed before 1914. There's maybe a dozen Tiffany windows. And that kind of imbalance is also reflected in the church construction, the ecclesiastic construction, there are a handful of Presbyterian and Episcopal churches and hundreds of Catholic churches of all different denominations, whether they're Irish, whether they're German, Italian, and into the 1920s, Polish. And they wanted figurative windows from 
supplied by Germany. Even the Italians bought FX Zettler of Munich. He was son-in-law to Franz Meyer and bought Franz Meyer windows or they bought Innsbruck windows. There's also a nice instance of um, where Tiffany tries to compete. This is at Second Presbyterian Church. The Palmers uh, furnished a window that is taken directly from a Franz Meyer window and just scaled up a little bit with Tiffany's glass and it's Jesus in the children window. And it was a Meyer design, a Meyer commission. It's in an engraving book that Meyer funded and all that. So there's direct competition. Meyer never copies a Tiffany window. But Tiffany does, at least in one instance that I'm aware of, finds inspiration in a Meyer window. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Okay, excellent. I like the way you put it. Find inspiration in. I, I shall remember that phrase uh, indeed. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Rolf. Uh, can you give me the next slide, please? And we're going to come back at the panelists. So what I'm interested in here really is which is the one that has been really the more significant out of Tiffany or Pugin and why? So this is the head to head, as it were, the heavyweight bout here. And I'm, I'm going to go in reverse order. So I'm going to finish off uh, with Jasmine. So Rolf, I know you just finished speaking. Sorry about that, but I want to come back to you. So uh, Tiffany or Pugin, what's your comment, please? Pugin, the reason is he develops a medieval style that Franz Meyer likes. And the Munich <laughs> school is based on, Fran on Pugin style, not on Tiffany's style. And, the, and Franz Meyer gets going in 1847. His first windows are in the Cologne Cathedral. And it's a medieval style that's akin to Pugin, or they're sort of playing off of each other intellectually. And it's the German English axis as opposed to the German American axis, if you will. Terrific, great. Thank, thank you very much. So we have one for Pugin at the at the moment. So uh, Jennifer, Pugin or Tiffany? Decidedly, Tiffany. <laughs> but Tiffany wasn't really locked into the Gothic tradition and he did he did base many works on Gothic tradition and Renaissance windows but very quickly moved out of that and really became um, not limited to only churches um, but was for um, household windows so his reach was much greater than just ecclesiastical. But remember, Catholics only had so many churches. There were many other denominations that had many, many churches. So there's really, in the United States, there's very few places that you can go to that you can't find a Tiffany window. So his reach was great. Um, and Tiffany, you know, really in the 1870s, he and Lafarge were the ones that developed opalescent glass um, as applied to windows. And so this streaking of color, he really resented, especially by the 17th century, how the glass had been painted um, and really muted the color, the natural color that was in the glass. So instead he used glass to paint with. And so it became a canvas using the material of glass and so um, I don't think that uh, there's any question that Tiffany really held his own. Excellent, Th thank you very much. So two of our judges that were as spoken, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, you'll get a chance to vote for it later. So, so Jasmine, which one are you gonna go for? You may have the most powerful uh, position at the moment amongst our three judges. Over to you, Jasmine. Well, well I'm afraid it's gonna have to be Pugin, of course. Oh. Um, I mean, without Pugin's foundations that were laid there for the, revival of stained glass, you know, bringing back stained glass into churches, ultimately, without the likes of him, um, the, all these other people wouldn't exist. Um, glass wouldn't have maybe gone into museums, some of that glass that Rolf, Rolf showed. But I think also in terms of the, the history of design, uh, architecture and stained glass, he's a really key figure. And just to kind of uh, give some evidence of that, if you like, after the Great Exhibition, the British um, government set aside a budget to buy works from the uh, exhibition. And a third of the British um, budget was spent on Pugin designed wares, which went to form the nucleus of the, the founding collection of the, the world's first kind of museum of decorative arts, the v &A as we now know it. And those objects are still there as examples of mid 19th century Gothic revival um, 
items. So beyond stained glass and in stained glass, undoubtedly Pugin. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. So at the moment we have two for Pugin and uh, one for Tiffany, but of course we'll be coming to you for the, for the poll. Let's move over to the questions and answers now. Uh, thanks very much. So we have uh, eight in there at, at least. So let me see if I can pull them up here. Let's see. So cab rank principal, we have uh, Arthur Seymour, master constructor. Thank you ever so much for your question. So panel, the puging pictures look more like painted glass rather than stained glass. Were the names used interchangeably? Who would like to lead us on that, please? It, it's, yes, just to summarize then a, a kind of it's a, a common kind of misnomer that this stained the term stained glass is used in a very general way to describe um, windows made out of lots of different techniques so stained glass uh, often does include painted glass uh, as well as colored glass held together with lead um, there's various variations and if you want to find out more about that I would suggest coming to the stained glass museum um, and we can see all those examples and see all the varieties of stained glass out there of which we we just saw uh, a few different examples using slightly different techniques and Great, if I uh, could just say um, the 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 term that we always used is leaded glass because really the um, enameling and painting was limited to faces and hands, but in many of the um, commissions and the works that Tiffany did in leaded glass, there's, there's almost no paint involved whatsoever. It's all done within the glass. And that's the main difference with the American right. glass. And I could I add that uh, when we had the stained glass museum, as it was called out at Navy Pier, where we had 3 million visitors a year, we did, had a long discussion of what to call this creature that we were creating. And we had about 200 windows on display and we decided on stained glass because leaded glass just didn't give the right impression to people. And, and painted glass is they're looking at all sorts of tableware or whatever else that, oh, I have painted glass at home and they come with a beaker or something, a, a glass. And um, so we decided stained glass, but it was a lot, we had a lot of discussion and, and with quite a number of people about what to call the museum so that it wouldn't cause confusion, <laughs> which ultimately it did anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much. I, I, so I'm glad we've, we've clearly um, shown what we, uh, what we mean by stained glass uh, here, leaded glass, beakers and all the rest of it. So Master Constructor, thank you very much for, for for asking that one, maybe we will need a, a webinar on terminology. Next one, Vivian, I'm really excited to hear about Tiffany's direction towards neoclassical and the aesthetic uh, movement. I know this was similar in Glasgow in the same period and have been trying to study these connections. Is this a topic you could elaborate on? Any of our experts want to speak Tiffany, on that? Tiffany was really, um, you know, he grew up in America during the Civil War which was a very cold, terrible era, obviously. And so really it was natural for him to seek beauty and to really kind of fill the world with beauty from that point on. And so the aesthetic movement, I really feel like he was the biggest part of. And, um, you know, it's, he's also connected to Art Nouveau because he was represented by Siegfried Bing, of course, from um, Art Nouveau, his gallery and was exhibited there. He exhibited in London in 1899, and of course had his works um, in Germany, throughout Europe, even in the V&A. And so, um, you know, he became an international person and wasn't really, you can't define him only by one movement. Thank you, I'll Jennifer. Second what Jennifer I'll second what Jennifer just said, because Tiffany is a great person in activities, in reach, and he did have a good reach into Central Europe. People in Budapest studied with Tiffany in New York. They made a pilgrimage. Prague, stud, peep, artists in Prague studied with Tiffany in New York. And in Vienna, they admired Tiffany. Most of it was the bl blown glass and glass lamps, not so much the windows in 
Eastern or Central Europe. But the blown, uh, but the lampshades, very po enormously popular and uh, very influential. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much uh, indeed. Let's move on to our, our next question by Alex uh, Nelson. Did the practitioners featured, if still alive, embrace Art Nouveau design or later still Art Deco design? Or was that the province of an entirely new generation of artists? Anybody would like to lead on that, Jennifer? Uh I can speak on um, Tiffany that uh, he was very much at the heart of uh, Art Nouveau and not only with his stained glass, his leaded glass, but with, as Rolf had mentioned, his blown glass, um, also furniture. I mean, there's um, any number of things that he was involved in. By the time Art Deco came in, it was really a, a rethinking after the First World War um, of materials and um, kind of excess. And so it was a new, uh, it really changed things. And so Art Deco, there's less of an impact, although you can see it in his metal works and his glass over that period, but it, it, he had much of a less of an impact of Art Deco. Same Thank with the uh, Chicago-based group, the Art Nouveau may get a kickstart in Chicago in uh, glasswork, metalwork, Woodwork with Louis Sullivan and others, but it didn't. It wasn't sustainable in Chicago, and it moved to Paris. It moved to Brussels. It moved to Berlin, and there it was sustainable for another generation of artists. Same with Art Deco. the The American Midwest. Once you get away from the East Coast and not all the way to California, there's a lot of expanse in between. It didn't have that uh, sustainability. Great, right. thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, next question, uh, Judy Nyswanda, uh, uh, forgive my pronunciation, I've done that wrongly. Uh, did people who purchased the secular items, might be one for you, Jasmine, stoves, chandeliers, etc., integrate these objects into interiors in with uh, objects in other styles, or did they throw everything out and create entire medieval rooms? Jasmine. And that's a really good question, Judy. Um, certainly one of the struggles that Tiffany and his collaborators had was actually choosing which items to exhibit. They didn't have much time to prepare and where possible they borrowed objects from uh, people who had commissioned these things already. Um, some of which I said already was commissioned for Pugin's home. But we know that after the medieval court, there were people who then fashioned their house um, in this kind of medieval style and ordered uh, objects uh, either from Pugin and Hardman, um, their collaborators, or, or other companies that started to do the same thing. Um, but certainly the, the the jardinaires and the garden seats and text, some of the textiles and tiles were, were from Pugin's house, the Grange. There was a staircase that was for Horstead Place in Sussex. Um, and I can't remember where the, where, the, where the stoves were. I think one was from for Alton Towers, quite a few items from Alton Towers. Uh, now I know a very important theme park, um, but actually before it was a theme park, it was the, the house of the, um, the, the Earl of uh, Staff Staffordshire, no, Earl of Shrewsbury, sorry. Uh, I'm remembering it's in Staffordshire, Earl of Shrewsbury. So, so there were objects that were actually going into people's interiors. And yes, it did influence things. Um, I'm sure some also integrated it into a, a mesh of styles that, that Pugin wouldn't have approved of. Uh, so I hope that answers a little bit of your question. Uh, indeed, thank, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're actually uh, out of time now, but of course I've realized there's a question here asked by the master Glazier, which means therefore we're not out of time and therefore you can answer <laughs> this one as well, which means, are there any photographs of Pugin's medieval court? as it was in 1851, Jasmine? Not to my knowledge, and I've never seen one published um, in any of the, the books on Pugin, um, but there are photographs of a later medieval court um, at the Crystal Palace in Sydenham, which sometimes can be mistaken uh, for the 1851 Great Exhibition. The, the Crystal Palace was uh, resurrected in a slightly different format um, in 1854, and there was a medieval court um, but it was not Pugin's medieval court. Very kind. Thank, thank you very much uh, indeed for those. 
So ladies and gentlemen, as I promised, it's now your turn to decide who might be the more influential, Pugin or Tiffany. So let me bring up the poll for you. Let me get it here. So poll number two, Pugin versus Tiffany, launch the polling. So now I can see it's come up live. If you would like to cast your vote, please, Pugin, Tiffany, Pugin, Tiffany. I can see them coming in. You can't yet, it's very exciting. Different voting is going on. 65%, 68% of people have voted. 73% of all electronic voting is very exciting. 80% have voted now. We'll give it 10 more seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, two, one, and the polling is ended, and I can actually see the result. Let me see if I can share this with you. It's just something that's come up blocking it. So end the polling. Here we are. Who's going to win? Share the results. There we go. So Pugin wins as well amongst the audience. So Jennifer, I'm afraid uh, <laughs> Tiffany has not got it there. There we are. I wasn't even allowed to vote myself. So Pugin, 66% of the votes. Tiffany, 34%. You've heard it here. No doubt be picked up by the major newswires around the world tomorrow. Uh -huh. You can say, as Max Boyce, you were here indeed. There we are. Terrific. Thank you ever so much uh, indeed for, for taking part in that. And now I'd like to invite the Master Glazier to address us. Master. You're on mute, Master. I think I'm no longer on mute. Thank you, David. I was just looking in the chat room and I can tell you that um, some of you in there are absolutely refusing to accept defeat and you, you want a re-vote. We'll have to see what, what, we can, what we can do about that. I have stayed in Pugin's house at the Grange. Um, some of you may also have done that and it's an amazing place to um, immerse yourself in Pugin's aesthetic. I've also visited the Morse Museum and seen the chapel that was part of the um, exposition in, in Chicago for Tiffany. They're both amazing things. Um, I would urge you if you can to go and visit the Morse um, in Florida to go and visit the Driehaus Museum in Chicago and for sure go and visit the Stained Glass Museum in Ely in Cambridgeshire, all well worth visiting. I just have now to say thank you to our experts, Jasmine, Rolf and Jennifer. Thank you, David, for um, moderating effectively as ever. And also thanks to our new clerk, Liz Wicksteed, who has been working busily behind the scenes tonight. You'll see with the next slide up that we want to give you a taster of things to come. The first thing is about the installation and investiture for our new master. I very soon give up my badge and our new master Michael Dalton takes over and already has a Christmas online entertainment planned. For all of you who are not glaziers, we do, I think, plan to have a webinar series next year and hope to have an international flavour again. I think that would be great. And also we support new student and emerging glass artists and the prize giving for our competitions and awards takes place in May. So that's a date for your diaries. David, thank you, back to you. Most kind, thank you very much indeed, uh, Master. Uh, here are the, the contact details of our experts and the various institutions that they are engaged with. I thought they're all fantastic. Uh, I'm sure you would agree. Do uh, look at what they're doing uh, and obviously reach out uh, and say hello. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? Now, for those of you who are not members of the Glaziers and particularly for those 6% who said they were interested in becoming a member of the Glaziers, here is the link. Uh, please do have a look at it. And obviously during this um, exceptional time, we are doing virtual admission ceremonies uh, via Zoom Airways, uh, as it were. So, so do get in, uh, in touch with us over that. If I might have the next screen, please. And then this one really is just our virtual presence. 
in a way, it's trying to avoid us, really. So we have our website. We have our very big Facebook um, uh, page up there, uh, Facebook account, sorry, Twitter. And, of course, there's a LinkedIn site as well. So lots of information there. Uh, do reach out for us. And, of course, particularly our friends within, within the livery movement. Now, I would just like to say personally here, um, thank you very much uh, to, to the master for leading on these webinars so obviously when march arrives oh goodness me what we're going to do so the master leapt straight into action and as i've said this is our fifth um webinar and it's great we can involve our international uh, friends and colleagues uh, within it thank you of course ever so much to jasmine jennifer and rolf for your clear and superb uh, expertise uh, thank you to to the clark and the backroom team that make all this happen and of course Ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much for being here. Thank you for all the comments in the chat and thank you for the vote where, of course, as we know, Pugin uh, won. So I wish you all uh, to go again to be safe and thank you ever so much uh, for joining us. And that's it from us. Goodbye.